Welcome to the second season of the WDC Distinguished Lecture Series. This season revolves around effective altruism, and the episodes are organized in coordination with the Effective Altruism Debate Championship. Today, our speaker is Kat Woods. Kat is the co-founder of Charity Entrepreneurship, a startup incubator for effective altruist charities. It provides training, seed funding, and the other things necessary to kickstart an effective nonprofit. It is also the give well for what organizations to start, rather than fund, doing extensive research to identify interventions where there is a gap that is cost-effective and evidence-based. Charity Entrepreneurship is funded by the Open Philanthropy Project and has helped multiple high-impact charities get started. Previously, Kat co-founded Charity Science Outreach, a meta-organization that raised nine counterfactual dollars for high-impact charities for every dollar spent. Subsequently, she co-founded Charity Science Health, a direct poverty charity that received multiple grants from GiveWell and has served hundreds of thousands of families in India. Kat's talk is titled How to Prioritize Causes, and it's the second episode of our season. We're excited to have Kat on board, and for similar content, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hi. I'd like to start off by imagining a scenario where you're going for a walk with your mom and your dad out in the woods somewhere. And, uh, you know, it's going really well, but then your mom steps on a rusty nail. What do you do? Well, probably the first thing you do is Google what you're supposed to do uh, with a rusty nail. Like, are you allowed to take it out? Should you keep it in and wait for a doctor? What do you do in that scenario, right? So Googling it. Another thing you might do is call 911 or whatever number it is in your local spot, uh, call an ambulance and have them take care of it. Or alternatively, you might recruit your dad's help and turn to him and get him to do one of those while you do the other. However, when you look over, your dad somehow has managed to be, like, get himself into a situation where he's hanging from a cliff, just about to fall into a body of water that's filled with alligators. You know, just bad situation. Bad situation happening right now. So what do you do, right? So what do you do in this situation? Well, obviously go immediately and save your dad. You pull him up, you know, and uh, you're like, dad, how did you manage to do that? And then you go and you help your mom and go and do that, right? And, uh, you know, then you go about your day and fortunately your parents managed to not die the rest of the trip. And uh, you got a cool story to tell. So you get to tell your friends all about it. And one day you're hanging out with a friend um, and telling them this crazy story. And they ask a really strange question. They say, well, why did you save your dad first? You're thinking like, what, what do you mean? Of course I saved my dad first, right? And, um, but they say like, but I mean, can you really compare the suffering of your dad versus your mom? And you say, well, I mean, sure, my mom was suffering too, but, um, you know, my dad was about to die from alligators. And they say, oh, but you really, you can't compare suffering. You know, it's a no, one person's suffering is totally incomparable. They're incommensurable between each other, right? So you can't really do that. And you say, but, but like my dad was about to die and my mom was just in pain. She would have been fine. She's on top of her tetanus shots. We're in like a developed country. There's good medical care, right? You know, she wasn't going to die. She was just in pain as opposed to death by alligators, right? And uh, they're like, Pfft. well, and even if you could compare, but you can um, there's no need to choose, right? You know, you can, you can choose both, you know, you can help everybody. And he said, well, no, if I had helped my mom, by the time I got to my dad, he would have been dead. By crocodiles, you know, so I had to choose one. Like I couldn't just help both. Right. And, uh, anyways, you, they, they ask a bunch of other weird questions like that and you leave and you're thinking that was a really weird experience. Like maybe I'm in sort of weird convoluted thought experiment, which you were, you were in a weird thought, uh, experiment. So now we're going to go back into the real world and think about what it means and like what, what this has to do with anything. I wasn't just making it up for the fun of it, although it was a little bit of fun. So the, the real thing is that unfortunately we're in this sort of situation every day, except instead of actually it just being like your mom and your dad, it's more like also there's like a little toddler who's about to fall into the lake full of crocodiles and there's a nuclear missile coming toward New York city and that sort of stuff. Stuff. It's just, there are so many problems in the world. There's just new world problems. We've got climate change, racism, sexism, a whole bunch of bad isms. We've got global poverty and cancer. We've got really expensive coffee. There are so many problems and we can't possibly choose them all, right? We're having to face these choices every day and they're very, very serious. So why aren't we actually doing this then, right? Why aren't we prioritizing? Why aren't we trying to pick the things that, like doing the equivalent of saving your dad from a crocodile instead of, you know, just helping your mom? Like, why aren't we doing that? And part of the reason that we don't do this 
is because we can't see that that's what's happening, right? So in this scenario, this is my nice convoluted thought experiment, you know, you could see immediately that there was two options in front of you, right? There was your dad hanging from the cliff and your mom with the nail on her foot, right? So you can see those differences and because you can see them, you know that you have to make a choice. But in real life, it's not like you're looking at somebody who's being oppressed from racism or whatever, and then also seeing climate change at the same time, and then also seeing a child soldier in Uganda, right? You're not seeing that. And because we're humans with like glitchy brains, we're not very good at dealing with things that we can't see right in front of us, right? So that's part of the reason why we don't actually go about prioritizing and comparing. Another one is that it's kind of uncomfortable, right? Because for one thing, people often think that if you're comparing, that means you're diminishing the other person's suffering, right? So if somebody has depression, right, and you're saying you're talking about child soldiers in Uganda where they also have depression, but then they also are child soldiers, um, people might feel that you're saying like, oh, well, your depression doesn't matter, right? And that's definitely not the case. At least for me, and I imagine for most people who are watching this, is you would love to help everybody, right? You know, the suffering of depression, the suffering of being a child soldier are both really bad and we don't want them, right? Um, the problem is we just can't choose everything. It's not like you don't care about your mom when, you know, you decide to help your dad who's hanging from a cliff. It's just that, you know, you have to choose and you know, you want, you want to help your mom too, right? But you know, you have to, you have to make decisions, right? So that's like the first thing is that people can often think that it's, um, that it's uh, diminishing. Another is to, it's uh, diminishing other people's helping, right? So say that you're working on preventing, um, like cancer and another person is trying to get like some, some kids to do local ballet or something. Right. Um, if you say like, Oh, Hey, maybe like cancer is higher priority. Right. They might think that you're criticizing them and being mean and saying like, Oh, like, you know, you're not doing anything useful. I'm doing something useful. And again, that's not what you're saying. Although, I mean, it can be that you could do something better, right? That can be it, right? But that shouldn't be taken as like this, uh, indictment on their character and on their worth and all that sort of stuff. Another reason we don't prioritize is because it's hard, right? You know, how do you compare somebody with, say, say, how do you compare somebody with acute depression who lives in the first world, right? With somebody who's living in a slum in Calcutta, uh, but who seems decently happy, but, you know, just can't uh, fulfill their potential because they can't possibly afford to go and, you know, uh, do the thing that they love most in life because they just have to pull a rickshaw every day. And that's the, that's the best they can do. And they would really love to be a writer or a painter or, you know, go into the debate championships, right? Like they'd really love to do these things, uh, but they can't. They're still not fulfilling their potential because of their extreme poverty uh, versus somebody who has extreme poverty, uh, extreme depression. How do you compare? That's really hard. It's really hard to compare those two things, right? However, you know, just because there are some things that are very close to each other and it's very hard to compare, there are other things that are completely different. So, for example, um, you know, the person in Calcutta who can't fulfill their potential versus me spilling my latte this morning. You know, I suffered. That was a good latte. I paid five bucks for it. However, I, I think I can say that I suffered less than the person who is having to be a, a rickshaw puller um, in Calcutta. So, you know, there you go. It's just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. There are definitely different categories of suffering and you can make some progress, right? And since you can, since you can tell that saving your dad from alligators is better than saving, uh, helping your mom with her, the nail in her foot, you can also um, compare different things. And so just because something's hard doesn't mean we should give up. Give up. Just because something is intellectually difficult to, to do doesn't mean like we're just like, well, who knows, right? There, there, there is progress we can make. So uh, now that we have established that we want to prioritize, we want to be able to save our dad before our mom, you know, how do you actually do it? And this is just you know, simple problem solving, right? So you you take the, um, I'm going to go into each of these steps further on, but uh, the, the overarching theme is first you define the actual problem, then you generate a whole bunch of options and come up with some criteria to judge them against. You learn more, you gather more information, and then you compare them. So uh, easy peasy. So first step, define. Um, what do you actually want to do, right? So it's it's not so simple. Often people are like, change the world. What does that mean for you, right? Um, it can be that you want to get rid of injustice. There's a lot of injustice in the world. You want to help make the world a more fair place. 
But maybe you also care about suffering. Maybe like, is it suffering or injustice? Maybe actually the reason that suffering is bad is because it causes suffering. Uh, the reason injustice is bad is because it causes suffering. Um, so maybe it's that, or maybe injustice is bad in and of itself. Um, you know, there's all these things. So immediately, basically, the first step is figure out meaning of life and ethics, right? So that's um, step number one, easy. Um, you know, there you go. Okay, I'll leave it to you guys. Um, but in all honesty, really looking into what your ethics are, right? So, and what your ethics should be. Maybe maybe ethics is just completely arbitrary, or maybe it's that actually there's some sort of um, uh, system out there of things that are objectively good and objectively bad, or maybe even if it's subjective and it's just in your head what counts as good or bad, what counts as good or bad to you, right? Because it can be really different. This is a hot, tough topic, but it's something that's so important to look into. Throughout most of history, uh, humanity has done things that we now now consider absolutely abhorrent, but it was considered totally fine. And it's not like they couldn't have figured it out. There were plenty of people at the time who thought about their ethics and they were like, mm, I don't know, it seems probably bad to like enslave a whole race just because of the color of their skin. And there were people there and you want to be that sort of person and you can be that sort of person if you actually sit down and think about these things. On top of that, there's not just ethics. That's like one subset of decision theory, right? So how to make good decisions. The next is just like, what are your values as a whole, right? Of what ethics is part of it, but there are other things you care about that are not really ethical in a certain sense, right? Like they're, they're just value neutral. So how much do you care about adventure versus security? And, you know, you might, you might value like other things and, and how much of your life and resources do you actually want to dedicate to helping people? Right. Because it can be that, you know, you want to just drop everything and really focus on just changing the world. And that's your mission in life. Or it can just be that, you know, you just want to donate a certain percentage of your money and you want to donate to something that's going to help. And you want to prioritize the things that are going to help more with your money than less. Next step is coming up with a bunch of options. So this is, if I could give you one tip, just in life, by the way, almost all of this advice also just ap applies to life in general. So even if you're like, screw humanity, like, you know, we're not that great anyways, um, you know, you can continue listening because this is just how to solve problems and make better decisions in general. So the biggest piece of advice, if you had to take away one thing from this entire talk, so pay attention, this is the thing. Don't come up with just one option. Most people I meet, they, when um, so one of my previous organizations, we ran a startup incubator. So basically we help people start charities, right? And people would come to me all the time with ideas about what to do. And they'd ask me what I thought. And my one question always was, what other options have you considered? And it was just one. Some people were amazing, had two, right? And usually what they're doing is they're just comparing it to the status quo. So, you know, going to school or getting a master's degree, kind of the, the next steps. Or this idea or like on um, other status quo is like staying at your current job. Right. So that was it. And the thing is, is that you can only do as well as the best option you're considering. Right. So if you're only considering two options, you can only do as well as the best one that you could pick. But if you have a whole bunch of options, you're much more likely to have something that's way better than the others. Right. So generate tons the, I, the possibility, like the probability that the one thing that you thought of is actually the best thing out of all the option space is pretty much zero, right? So generate a lot, a lot of options and spend a lot of time on this. This is your life. You've only got one of it, right? So go and like spend at the very least half an hour. Oh my God, just the, that's like absolute bare minimum. Really, you should be spending days, weeks on this and, and spread it out too, because you're going to come up with all these sorts of ideas. And the, I mean, this whole process is, it's not like you define the problem, then you generate options then you, you know, it's uh, it, you're going to be going back and forth throughout all of it, but like keep an eye out for options, try and generate tons. Some of the most influential people in the world and some of the most creative are not people who have good quality ideas so much as they just have a lot of quantity. They just come up with so many ideas. One of them's bound to be good. So be one of those people. It's not that hard. And it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, one of the first things you're going to notice, of course, when you try and come up with all these options is that there's a lot, like I just said. So, uh, one way to narrow the space down, so you're not having to look at everything is look for things that are neglected because if they're neglected, if not many people are working on it, you're much more likely to have like a marginal impact, 
right? Because say you're looking into uh, curing cancer, right? Tons of people are looking into cancer because honestly it affects rich white people. So of course people are going to look into it, but also it just affects everybody, right? And so tons of people want to fix it. It's a very popular cause. But if you're looking into something like um, uh, preventing malaria in the third world, that's not really on the top of most people's minds, you know, and so it gets really neglected. It's, it's just um, there's not nearly enough people working on it in comparison or curing malaria. That would actually be the best or like a vaccine. Um, we already have a cure for it, but a vaccine would be wonderful. So if you're considering going to the medical profession, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, one of the other things that you can narrow stuff down is whether it's tractable, like can you actually make a difference? Because there are some things that, you know, t say giving out bed nets in Africa for uh, preventing malaria. Easy, very tractable. You can make progress on that. Now, on the other hand, if say one of your things was, um, you know, preventing violence in the Congo, the Congo is there's a lot of stuff going on there. It's very, very difficult. It's like a very complicated problem. It's very entrenched. It's been going on for a very long time. And it's very unclear what you could possibly do to actually make progress there, right? So that's a more intractable problem. Um, and the other thing is look at important problems. Of course, you don't actually want to like go and solve something, you know, relatively minor, like uh, the expensiveness of uh, my coffee in the day. That's like, it's not that important, right? Whereas, uh, you know, helping people not die from malaria or that sort of stuff, that is important. Uh, and uh, another thing for uh, generating options and considering them is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So a lot of effective altruism has already looked into this quite a lot. And what they found is that some of the kind of top contenders for uh, good cause areas are global poverty. Again, it's because you know, if it doesn't affect rich white people, then you know, <laughs> it doesn't get taken care of. And so um, uh, global poverty is one of those things that's just like we just kind of take for granted. They're like, oh, yeah, occasionally we see something like sad on, you know, in some like random advertisement and everything. Right. But it's like this is one to three billion people. This is this is one in seven, at least, who are living in extreme poverty, one in seven people living in extreme poverty. And there's so much you can do. And we a lot of times the, the, the thing is it really does well on the tractability issue because we already know what to do. Right. So, um, you know, fixing homelessness in the first world. Difficult. Like a lot of times these are like the people where all of the easy things haven't worked. And we're trying to like figure out something else. Whereas, you know, we know how to get clean water. We fixed that problem. We know how to do it. We just need to actually put in the resources to actually make it happen, right? So it does really well in the tractability section. Um, and uh, of course, by the way, like this talk is going to be followed up by like people who give a specific talk for each of these cause areas later. So uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview. Um, and uh, for animals, uh, basically farmed animals are treated exceptionally terribly and uh you know there's a lot you can do in there to either make their lives better or you know prevent it from happening in the first place so lots of stuff there and then existential risks is basically um when uh you know making sure that humanity doesn't accidentally kill ourselves you know with climate change or various other technical advances uh you know um it really doesn't matter if we fix global poverty and fixed factory farming if um uh, we're all dead so that's like another one of the cause areas all right, next step is criteria. So generate your criteria, right, for what you're looking for in uh, the thing you're going to do. So obviously using science and reason, well, not obviously, unfortunately, like this is definitely, we're in currently a uh, renaissance when it comes to uh, applying science and reason to helping people. Um, I mean, this is like an old idea, like ever since like enlightenment, like humanist ideals, like let's use science and reason and make people happy. But um, there's a lot more nowadays about like actually running randomized controlled trials on poverty intervention. So really, really applying science and getting it so that we can actually have, like I, I liken it to, you know, uh, medicine used to kill more people than it helped. And then we started applying science to it. And now we've, you know, double, doubled our lifespan. Anyways, we've, we've increased our lifespan a lot and the quality of our life. Um, you can definitely see that if you read any old books from like the 1800s, you know, everybody's just dying all the time. They're like, oh yeah, you know, and then, or like Jane Austen dying at 30 and stuff like that. It's just that this is, you know, it just, was much more common to die, and now we just don't have that because we applied science to medicine, and now we're doing applying science to helping people in general and charity work. Um, neglectedness, which I covered before, you can also look at cost effectiveness. So, like, how much of a difference do you make per marginal effort put in, right? Because if you um, 
you know, there might be something that really like you feel like you're really helping, right? And you are, but it takes so much effort to cause this amount of helping compared to another thing that you could have done that would have had just as much impact for way less effort and resources. So uh, definitely looking for like leverage factor and cost effectiveness. Another criteria is personal fit. Actually think, what do you um, what are you good at, right? Like, what do you like to do? That sort of stuff, right? And take take a moment to really break that down. Don't just say personal fit. Think like, what do you really want in life? You know, um, you can have security. I think this is important, right? You don't want to always feel insecure. Um, and different people have different risk tolerances. Uh, how much adventure do you want in your life? Again, another important thing to keep in mind is that these sorts of things, um, uh, you know, you can have adventure and you can maximize that outside of work or within work. And, you know, like, so don't, don't, um, try and find something that does well on everything. Cause you can usually, usually you're going to have to, you know, trade off and stuff. Right. So, um, you can also look at, do you want to be, do you like working in big groups or do you like working on your own? How much free time do you want? What stress levels do you want? You know, this is one of those things where often when you're young, you think like, yeah, yeah, stress, it doesn't matter. And then later you're like, Ugh you know, it would be nice to have a bit more of a relaxing job, um, even if it has comes with like less prestige and less accomplishment. So think about those things, really dig deep down because this is the sort of thing that really matters. And once you've already chosen a career or like a path to go down often, um, you know, it becomes really hard psychologically to re, uh, to go down a different path. I mean, you can always go down a different path, but most people just won't. So, uh, you know, just in case you weren't stressed enough about deciding what to do with your life, I'm going to add some more and say that is really important. Super, super important. So spend a lot of time on it and then you don't have to feel stressed about it. Next step is gather more information. Just learn, 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 right? Because, you know, if you haven't done your research, you're almost definitely wrong. To be fair, if you have done your research, you're almost definitely wrong too. But, but you have less chance of being wrong. And you can get better and better at this over time. And, you know, it's just one of those lifelong things where you want to be somebody who's learning as a lifetime thing. This isn't something you just do at college and then you end it, right? And uh, it's also a really good skill to be good at self-directed learning, right? Um, this is like one of those skills that will just help you so, so much in life and you make, make your life so much richer and better. And uh, so, yeah, so just read, like try and fill in this. So you have your criteria, you have your options, try and learn about them. Try and see if you can just confirm that you're like, you're like, oh yeah, I think this thing is evidence-based. Like, well, go check. Try and see if you can come evidence against it, right? So Google, like, you know, the thing that you want and then say like, well, uh, but it's not true, right? Like what's wrong with this, right? So try and destroy it. Try and destroy it beforehand. Otherwise, you know, you're going to find out later and you'll have wasted all this time. And, uh, you know, don't just read books, read online, listen to podcasts, um, watch things, uh, talk to people, talk to people. This is fantastic. You can learn so much from talking to people. And if you're at all extroverted, this is lots of fun. And then you're also building up a network and obviously having friends, friends are good. You know, just, uh, uh, talking to people is definitely one of those underutilized sources of information. Uh, and, uh, you know, make sure to keep records while you're doing this. Cause you're going to forget, um, again, good life tip. Just keep records of all the things you're learning and then review it occasionally, um, put it into spaced repetition software, that sort of stuff, because otherwise you're going to forget and then you're going to make worse decisions. Um, and then once you've compared, what you can do is you can share this with other people, um, share it with friends. You can even also share it online and then get feedback and then you can learn from other people and then you can find out where you kind of went wrong and, you know, harness the, the uh, intelligence of other people. Uh, next step is to compare. So now you've got all the information, you know, you've uh, got your options, you've got your criteria. So start comparing. I mean, this is a really complicated step. Um, and there's no way I can do it justice in this talk, but, uh, some things you can do is, uh, you can look for options that dominate others. So basically they just do better on every single area. There's no way that, and so they're dominant. Um, and then, so you can get rid of the ones that are dominated. Um, you can create like a little index where what you do is you take all the, the, the ratings on your different criteria and you can weight them by certain things and you can either add them up or multiply them depending on how nerdy you are. I have so many spreadsheets comparing ideas and, um, and, uh, which is a great way to do things by the way. Um, you can check out, um, uh, spreadsheet decision making, um, on charityentrepreneurship.com for like a more uh, in-depth guide on how to do that. Um, um, but of course it's math and they're made up numbers. So, you know, you can't take that at face value and be like, well, 
numbers said this, that's it. Um, at some point, you're also going to just have to sit down and do some reasoning and kind of go with your gut. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be ambiguous. There's not going to be like, well, most of the time, there's not going to be a clear cut answer, but you can have some things that are better than others. And, uh, you know, if you want to be a rational agent in the world, you're just going to have to get used to the fact that you're never going to be certain about anything. The, the more rational and intelligent you become, the less you'll feel you'll know anything. And, uh, uh, it's a pain in the butt. But anyways, there we are. That's life. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be able to deal with ambiguous, uh, ambiguous things. And uh, then you make your decision. Easy peasy. So some of you might be listening to this and be like, ugh, that sounds like a lot of work. And others of you might be like, yes, this sounds awesome. I love this. This is so exciting. You know, I love, I love the intellectual challenge. I really want to make a difference. And this is interesting. This isn't just like, you know, um, you know, donate to your local hospital or, you know, uh, recycle. This is like some interesting stuff. So, and so if you're excited, do it, do it. You can, you can stop this right now. You can go and you can start doing the research. You can check out effective altruism. This is filled a whole community that's filled with people doing this. Um, so just like, look at the websites, do start reading, start generating your ideas, keeping records of it, you know, thinking of the meaning of life and all that. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. For those of you who are like, nah, then uh, don't worry. Lots of people have already done the work and you can just read what they say and then follow the advice. And it's pretty simple. So um, if you just want to donate somewhere and you just want to know that's going to do well, um, there's GiveWell and they spend, they are the, some of the smartest, most critical people ever. And they go and they find the, the charities that withstand the test of their criticism. Um, and they mostly recommend donating in a, uh, um, global poverty. And, uh, I can't recommend them enough. They are just super crazy rigorous folks, right? You know, you can trust their thing and you can just choose. That's the place you donate. Whenever you want to feel like you're making an impact, just donate that way. Um, there's also EA funds. And what EA funds does is they, uh, you donate to them for a particular cause area. So you can get, donate to like the EA fund for animals or the EA fund for existential risk. And then you have people who full-time think about this stuff and they find good giving opportunities within that. So that's for like the other cause areas. And it can also be for poverty as well. If you're considering what career and you want to make a difference with your career, then there's 80,000hours.org. Um, it's called 80,000 hours because you have 80,000 hours of roughly of, uh, uh, hours of work in your life. And so they give lots of advice, really in-depth career advice about what you should do if you want to have the most impact. And then lastly, um, this is kind of a subset of career, which is that if you want to start a charity, which um, I totally recommend having um, started a few, it's it's one of those things that just um, gives you such purpose in life. And it's you end up having a really interesting one. Like right now I'm out in, um, you know, the desert and everything. You get to choose your, your location. Um, it's pretty great. Um, and, uh, you know, and just a while ago I was in Rwanda and, you know, Starting, starting charities is very fun and interesting. It's, it's very difficult. So you have to have to have the definitely grit and, uh, good, uh, good coping mechanisms, but, uh, you know, I definitely recommend it. And then if you're interested in that, there's, um, my previous charity called, uh, charity entrepreneurship. And we basically, uh, are an incubator for charity ideas. So we help set you up with, um, mentors with a potential co-founder, um, with good ideas. Cause we also do prioritization research in terms of, uh, what are the best charities to start and, um, uh, and also some seed funding help get you off the ground. So, so there you go. Um, that's, uh, that's how you do cause prioritization and thinking about how best to help. So, uh, you know, you define the problem, solve ethics, think about the meaning of life. You generate a whole bunch of options, criteria, and then uh, you learn and you learn and you learn. And uh, I mean, this is just good advice for life is that you're going to have to learn a lot. You're going to have to make choices and prioritize some things over others. And, uh, you know, how you prioritize and what options you consider is uh, you're going to have much more impact and a much better life. Thank you very much.